Well, I, I want to start out spending a little time talking about the early astronomers. Uh, you have to remember that in the 16th century, the Catholic Church was kind of in a pickle. They, uh, they needed at that time to have a calendar that actually functioned. They were using the Julian calendar, which was actually set up by Julius Caesar in about 47, a, uh, 47 BC uh, to, uh, to determine dates. And they, so they were basically about 10 days off on everything. And uh, as, it, as related to, to the sky. So they wanted their astronomers to develop an accurate calendar so they could use it to get people in on uh, church on time and uh, know when Christmas was and everybody was in agreement as to when it was. So uh, they, they sent out the word uh, that a, the astronomers needed to update the information they had circa 47 uh, BC and uh, come up with some new calendars uh, for the church. Well, that all went fine, except uh, this guy, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, uh, he looked at the evidence and um, he really discovered that uh, the, the uh, Earth seemed to be going around the sun, as you probably already know. And uh, he claimed that it was going around in a circular motion. Now, N Nicholas uh, was very, very concerned, as he should have been, uh, about uh, reporting this because this kind of thing was heresy. The church thought the, the, the earth was the center of the universe, that God created everything to make them the center of the universe, and now here he is, he's, he's uh, come to find out that uh, all the data seems to best fit uh, the earth going around the sun. Uh, he was pretty convinced the church wouldn't be too happy about that. Uh, so uh, he waited till actually on his deathbed uh, to publish uh, his information, and uh, it was in 1514 uh, that he that he published it. As the story goes, it was on his deathbed. Uh, of course, those kinds of things we can never know for sure. But uh, but he published it, and he had some good reason to be concerned. Uh, there was a guy named Bruno who they actually burned at the stake for saying uh, that the uh, that the universe was infinite. So you really didn't want to go around saying things that might get you burned at the stake. So no wonder Copernicus waited. And uh, this this fellow here, uh, Tycho Brahe, um, he he had a, 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 was cutting edge for the time, the most cutting edge uh, astronomical observatory uh, probably in the world. And all it really was at that time was the back his backyard. He would go out every night. He didn't have a telescope. But he would go out every night and he'd look up at the stars on clear nights in cold or heat of the summer, no matter what. He was out there taking uh, data on the sky. And he did that for over 30 years. And of course the word got around about all how good his, his uh, data collection was. Now the only problem was that Brahe wasn't very good uh, with mathematics, so he was limited on what he could say about the information. Well, another guy, Johannes Kepler, was not bad at math. In fact, he was very good at math. And when he heard about Brahe's data, uh, he, he was uh, uh, salivating, I'm sure. And so he, uh, he convinced Brahe uh, that he wanted to work with him and that he would do a good job and that uh, Brahe uh, knew why he was trying to get with him. He wanted his data, so he was careful. But he began to trust uh, Kepler and eventually, as the story goes, uh, when, when uh, Brahe died, he turned over his data to Kepler. And it took Kepler four years uh, to where he was able to use that data to figure out his uh, three laws of planetary motion, which I'll talk to you about in just a minute. But I want to go on and I want to uh, talk about, a little bit about uh, Galileo, because uh, Galileo was kind of uh, wild at the time. Uh, a lot of people think he invented the telescope. He didn't, but he certainly refined the telescope and made, and made a much better one. And he was uh, at least the first one we know of that pointed his telescope towards the heavens. He looked at the moon, he saw the craters on the moon. In fact, uh, the dark areas on the moon, he, he thought they were oceans. He called them mare uh, for sea. And um, as we know now, they're basaltic lava flows. More about that later. And Galileo thought, okay, you know, I'm sure that all I have to do, uh, you know, one of the things at the time, and I gotta put things in historical perspective here, um, one of the things was that uh, the, the church taught that the heavens uh, were stationary. And, and Galileo, here's Galileo looking at, at Jupiter, and he's seeing moons going around Jupiter. So he, he knows that, you know, that, that it, the stars and, and 
things in the sky uh, aren't necessarily fixed, that, they, that, that they're moving and uh, 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 that they actually have bodies circling them, not the Earth. So he, he thought, okay, look, these guys are sensible at, at the Vatican. I'll just take my telescope to the Vatican and I'll, and I'll let them see what I'm seeing and, and certainly uh, they'll come to, to realize the error of their ways. So Galileo took his telescope and headed for the Vatican and uh, he, he ran into a buzzsaw, uh, to be honest with you. You know, it wasn't so much that, that the Vatican was upset at what Galileo was saying because they had their own astronomers that were telling them basically the same thing, and that is that not only does the sun uh, go around, uh, sorry, that the earth go around the sun, but the, the, there's planetary motion. So they were seeing a lot of the same things that Galileo was. Uh, the, the thing that upset the church was that they didn't want uh, necessarily this message getting out uh, to the masses. Uh, they thought it might undermine uh, their authority. So they said, look, Galileo, you know, just go home and, and forget that you, you, know, you discovered all this, and uh, we'll take it from here. And so they, they sent Galileo home, and Galileo got really irritated at it, and he, and he published a manuscript, and he made fun, basically, in his manuscript uh, of the Catholic Church. It's called A Dialogue on the Two uh, Chief Systems of the World. And he even called uh, a character in there that represented the Catholic Church as Simplico. So uh, it's a, 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 an amazing story and uh, uh, got Galileo in a whole lot of trouble. In fact, uh, the Vatican Church didn't find much humor in it and uh, they assigned uh, a cardinal named Bellarmine to prosecute Galileo, and uh, Galileo was found guilty and ended up spending the last 11 years of his life under house arrest. Not a, not a good thing uh, for a man like that. But of course, you know the rest. Uh, science wins out in the end. Uh, we now know that the Earth goes around the sun. Uh, Copernicus was wrong. It goes around in an in a elliptical orbit, and, and that kind of leads me into talking about the three laws uh, that Kepler came up with for planetary motion. And uh, the first one is probably pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Each planet revolves around the sun. Uh, that was uh, big news back then. And uh, not only do they revolve around the sun in an orbit, but they also uh, do so in an elliptical orbit. And uh, as you can see in this diagram, uh, when a planet is closer to the sun, uh, it's going to move faster than if it's further away. Uh, you can see the distance A1 on, on the orbit is greater than the distance covered by A2. So when it gets closer to the sun, it has to travel faster to cover that distance. And then the, the final uh, law that Kepler came up with was the rate of motion of a planet uh, around uh, the sun is related to the distance from the sun. Wow, if this doesn't sound like something Newton came up with with gravity, you know, the inverse uh, square law, uh, boy, uh, it, it was. And, and Galileo was so close to uh, discovering uh, gravity and uh, coming up with an equation for gravity. Just missed it. Newton had to come along later on and define um, gravity. But uh, he, he was there, basically. Uh, the closer a, a planet is to the sun, uh, the faster it moves, and, and we, we kind of know that instinctively, but we've talked about it before when we, when we talked about motions of, of, uh, of stars around uh, galaxies. So those are uh, Kepler's uh, three laws of planetary motion. Uh, let's take a, a, a look now uh, at some details of, of our solar system. Uh, you're, you're looking at uh, the Oort cloud. Now, now this is a cloud of material uh, that is very far away. Uh, that, that elliptical circle you see in the center of the diagram, well that represents the, the orbit of, of Sedna around the, uh, the solar system. So if you look in the, in the next diagram, you can actually see the red orbit around the solar and where the solar system is. So you can't even see the solar system in uh, the, the picture of the Oort cloud there. So <clears throat> it gives you an idea of, of the, uh, how far away the Oort cloud is. Now, what is the Oort cloud? Well, uh, basically it's the source of the comets. They come uh, probably from the Oort cloud. Uh, we think that the Oort cloud consists of uh, these um, gaseous, or I should say ice, or rock uh, kinds of material, the same things that are, we find in comets. And uh, once in a while, gravity will, will pull uh, something in uh, from the Oort cloud and it will uh, perhaps go into an orbit around the sun. 
Haley's Comet's a good example. We'll talk more about uh, comets and Oort cloud uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, now, if we go in a little closer, you're going to start seeing these objects. Uh, some of them have huge orbits, like Sedna. Uh, Sedna uh, was uh, discovered in uh, 2003, and uh, you see Eris there. Uh, Eris was d discovered in 2005. And then, uh, the, you, you, I hope you can see the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt uh, is made up of things like Eris. Eris is, by the way, the biggest object in the Kuiper Belt. And, and what's really cool is, that Pluto is also out there now, and, in, and it's considered a body in the Kuiper Belt. Eris is actually bigger than Pluto, so uh, when when we discovered Eris, well, that kind of sealed the fate of Pluto being a planet. Uh, either we were going to make these objects like Eris and Sedna and, and uh, other objects that uh, went around the sun planets, or we were going to uh, uh, downgrade Pluto as a planet. Maybe some of you don't even know that Pluto used to be a planet, but it, it was a planet. It's no longer considered a planet. I think it's been that way for about 15 years now. Uh, but the Kuiper Belt is, again, made up of these objects. Uh, uh, they, there are a lot of different things. We'll see some examples of objects in the Kuiper Belt. We'll even talk a little bit about Pluto and Eris later on. Then we get into the, uh, the planets. The outer planets are considered the gaseous planets. Uh, uh, if you go in order from uh, the furthest, it's Neptune, Uranus, uh, Saturn, and finally Jupiter, uh, Jupiter being the, the biggest planet. And then if you look into the inner solar system, uh, you're going to see the asteroids. A lot of people think that if you're going through the asteroid belt in a spaceship, you're going to have to watch out and, and not crash into uh, another uh, asteroid because they're, they're so dense in there. And from this picture, it does look pretty dense. But it's not. In fact, when uh, they were trying to find, uh, or when they were sending Voyager out, the scientists said, hey guys, uh, they told the engineers, can, can you get us to do a flyby of an asteroid so we can get a picture of it on our way out to the outer uh, solar system in the 1970s? And the engineers had a very difficult time trying to time this so they could even get close enough to uh, to an asteroid to take a picture. So this concept that, that you're going to you know, crash and that the Voyager was going to Voyagers were going to have trouble getting through uh, the uh, the asteroid belt is kind of pure fiction. Uh, well, from the asteroid belt, then you go uh, as you go from uh, the outer uh, inner solar system. You go from Mars uh, towards the sun. You go from Mars, Earth, Venus, and then uh, finally Mercury, and then all the way to the sun. So I would like to uh, take you uh, on uh, even more uh, of a tour of the solar system. But first, I'd like to start showing you some, some factual information about the solar system. Now, now, why am I doing this? This is important. I'm taking the time to show you this information because uh, the whole objective of talking about uh, the planets and what's going on out there is to finally come to the conclusion about how the solar system formed. Because, uh, after all, we're, we're talking about uh, the history of the universe, Earth, and life here, so we want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of how uh, uh, the solar system formed and came together and what time. And, and we're going to have to use the evidence that we have, the data and the information we have, to say something about how that solar system formed. So, so here's our, our first slide of uh, some of the properties of the solar system. And, and this is the density of the planets. Now, now remember, the density is mass over volume. So, so you've got this volume factor in there. And we're, we're going to have to, when we consider densities, we're going to have to consider the immense stress that is on the interior of these planets. Uh, things are being crushed in there. This pressure that tends to even make objects more dense. Uh, so when we're thinking about density, uh, keep that volume uh, issue in mind. So uh, the first thing that probably needs to be pointed out is that the sun is uh, 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter in density. And look at how much different that is than the densities of the terrestrial planets. Now, now we think the sun is probably very similar in, uh, in composition and, and probably density, if you consider the pressures of the sun, probably density to, to what the early solar system mass was when it uh, was beginning to collapse. So, so you've got these terrestrial planets there, and um, 
and we, we're, we're seeing something different. Something clearly is different with the interior terrestrial planets. Uh, they're all around 5 grams per cubic centimeter. And I've put up some, some things for reference. A rock is like 3, uh, iron is 8, uh, and ice is 1. So, so uh, look, in order to explain 5s, uh, you're going to need something like iron uh, to, to uh, because you know, the rock can't do it, uh, and certainly uh, ice can't do it. So, so we're going to have to explain the terrestrial planets by using iron and nickel and, and uh, some, some other compounds that are, that are fairly dense. Now when you get out into the gaseous planets, uh, they are uh, appear uh, to be, in general, uh, made of gases and ices, and their, their density shows it. Their density is much closer to that of the sun. They're all around one. So uh, that tells us, uh, even with the extreme pressures, that we're probably dealing with gases and ices out there, but that's not the case uh, for the interior. So, so whatever scenario we come up with to explain how the solar system forms, we've got to keep in mind the differences in the densities of the planets. Now in this next slide, uh, I want to show you axial tilt, and I want to talk about how the, the planets uh, go around the sun. So, so how would we define this, uh, planets uh, orbiting the sun? Well, we typically uh, think of uh, standing on the north pole of the sun, which would be the same as standing on the north pole of the earth, and then looking down uh, on the plane of the solar system. And, and that's the first thing, probably, that I should tell you, is that all of the planets, all the eight planets, uh, and uh, for that matter, the asteroids uh, and most of the moons uh, are within a plane of the solar system, which is only eight degrees off of the equator of the sun. So there, it's almost all very flat out there in, in this, this disk or plane uh, of the solar system. And, and that's really important and going to be very important when we talk about the formation. And not only uh, is it in this plane, but the planets all circle the sun in the same direction, which is counterclockwise. So, so whatever caused the formation of the solar system, and I, and I think you're probably already thinking about this, it probably formed from some sort of protoplanetary disk that was encircling the sun, and the planets uh, all came together from that disk. Uh, that would explain you know, how they are remaining in a, in a disk today. Much more about that later on. But uh, uh, another thing that you should think about is that the axes are all at, at uh, some angle but uh, to, to the perpendicular or perpendicular to uh, that solar plane, except for two planets, Uranus and, uh, and Venus. So, so that's more evidence. And not only are, are they all that way, uh, except for those exceptions, but uh, they, they rotate in the same way that they go around the sun. Think about that. So you've got a rotation that's counterclockwise if you're standing looking at uh, down on the solar system. Each one of those planets is going counterclockwise as they go uh, on their axis, as they go around the sun counterclockwise. So, so everything really nicely fits into this concept of an early protoplanetary disk uh, that, that everything formed from. The, the two exceptions are uh, Uranus and Venus, so I want to talk about the right-hand uh, rule. Um, you've probably uh, heard of this before if you've taken chemistry or, or things like that, physics. Uh, what you do is you take your thumb and you point it in direction of the north axis, and as you curl your fingers around the planet, it'll tell you which way the planet rotates. So if we did that for Earth, in this example, by the way, the Earth's axis tilts about 23 degrees uh, off of perpendicular to the solar system, and its rotational axis is, is the same way. So we're talking about its rotational axis is 23 degrees off of the perpendicular to uh, the, the, the solar system plane. Uh, if you do the right-handed rule, you'll see that, that the rotation is going counterclockwise if you're standing on the North Pole. Once again, you, you're going to got to emphasize, you've got to be standing uh, on the North Pole uh, in order to uh, get that understanding. Look at Uranus. You have to point your, your thumb to, to the left there and then curl your hand around, and Uranus's axis is almost uh, horizontal. And then, and then Venus, you have to turn your thumb upside down and you do that and, and Venus is, is uh, circling at the opposite of the other planets. Now, 
how do we explain Venus and, and Uranus and, and how do we explain the tilt of planets like uh, Earth and Mars? Uh, they're, they're tilted about 23 and 25 degrees respectively. Well, we explain that by uh, simply, uh, we think anyway, uh, that during the formation when uh, there were a lot, a lot of material in our solar system, things were colliding in, the planets were getting bigger from sweeping up the material in the, in the planetary disk, there was probably collision of large objects with the planets. And uh, this probably tilted their axis or in some cases uh, altered their, their uh, axis so much that, that they're tilting below the plane of the uh, solar system. Uh, we can think of it, and I'll show you evidence of this later on from the moon, but we can kind of think of it as a, a pretty uh, active period in uh, the early solar system. Now what else uh, about this uh, do I want to tell you? Well, because, the and I'm trying to tell you this because I'd like you to get interested in, in, in a little bit in astronomy. Go out tonight, or on a clear night, and some if you can get away from lights, do that. And, and now you know that all of the planets are within a plane. By the way, that the moon is pretty much in that plane too. It's off a little bit, but not much. So the, the moon, and I don't think you'll have any trouble finding the moon at, at night. So look for the moon and, and look east-west. Uh, you're going to find that all of the planets travel east-west across the sky. So, so it's, this isn't, you know, brain surgery here. You're going to be able to find uh, those planets fairly easily. Uh, because you know what plane they're in. You don't have to be looking you know, to the north or to the south to find uh, Mars. It's going to be out there in this east-west path. So, so if it's visible uh, at night, you're going to be able to see it. That is, if it's on this side of, of the, the Earth at night, uh, you'll see it as a red dot up there. Now, this, I hope this makes sense to you, uh, because Venus and, 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 uh, and Mercury are orbiting on the inside of the Earth, well, when, when we're at nighttime here, we're facing away from the Sun and therefore facing away from Venus and Mercury. So we can only see Venus and Mercury when uh, we're sort of just as night is setting in or uh, dawn is arriving. So in the early uh, hours of the evening or the late hours of uh, early hours of the morning uh, around dawn. And that's precisely why Venus is called the morning or evening star. We only see it at that time. You're not going to see it over, the head, over your head at night because it's on the other side uh, of the Earth. So I hope this all seems very logical. And, and now you can apply these things that you're learning if you didn't already and go out there and look at some of these objects in uh, the solar system. It's, it's a really uh, spectacular place if you uh, haven't thought about it. I do want to emphasize that 99.8% uh, of the mass of our solar system is in the sun. And that's going to be rather important when we look at models as to how the solar system formed. Well, now on this particular slide I wanted you to get an idea of distances in our solar system. So we're using this term called AU, or astronomical unit. Uh, we we use this because it's the distance from the Sun to the Earth. And we set that up as 1, so that's 1 AU. If you want to know the absolute distance, well, say in meters, it's 149.6 trillion meters. Like it better in kilometers, it's 150 kilometers. It's 93 million miles. So we're talking about immense distances. One Earth away, 1 AU distance away is that distance and and you know uh, to further give you an idea of how far away the earth is from the Sun if the if the Sun decided to go out right now it would be more than eight minutes before we would find out about it that's how long it takes light to get from the Sun to us so that would be sort of like light minutes eight light minutes uh, to us in terms of distance so 1 AU equals about one, uh, eight light minutes if, if you want to think of it that way so we've got, uh, we've got some interesting things when we look at distances between the planets from the Sun. Look at the terrestrial planets. They're all within about 1.5 AUs of the Sun. But then go out and look at the, the, the uh, gaseous planets. They're, they're 5 and 9, 19, 30. Neptune's 30 AUs away from, uh, from the Sun. 
So the first thing I want you to recognize is that these planets, when, when the area that they're able to sweep up in material is uh, quite extensive and, and because of their distance away from the sun. So if you think about these planets going around, uh, the Earth is, 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 there's a distance of 0.7 to 1.5 between Mars and Venus. So the most probably the Earth is going to be able to pick up when it's forming and sweeping up material is that distance uh, between uh, Mars and Venus. And Venus is going to pick up some and Mars is going to pick up some. Whereas Jupiter has got 1.5, well we have to consider the asteroid belt, but it's got a lot of distance between the asteroid belt and, and Saturn, uh, 5 uh, or so AU. So it, it, it's no, not a surprise that the outer planets are bigger. Now, we do have to uh, explain uh, how uh, the, um, the composition of the outer planets, because they're more gaseous than the inner planets, which are, uh, have uh, virtually no gas compared to the outer, outer uh, planets. Uh, so we'll get into that. But I do want to, to emphasize that when we're sweeping up material, the outer planets um, are uh, sweeping up a material over a much uh, larger area.